Welcome to the Self Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Marie, a courage coach, creative soul, and adventure seeker. Since through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in 2019, I'm on a mission to help you embrace your most confident self so you can achieve your dreams too. If you're eager for deep conversations, big questions, and meaningful connections, join me on the quest to discovering how we can create a more magical and memorable life. Hello, nerds! How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm starting to feel better, I would say, but the last few weeks have been intense. A member of my family who had been ill for a while asked for, um, I don't know what the exact term is in English, medically assisted death. So it's legal here in Quebec, Canada. And it's when when you're suffering a lot and you're still conscious, you can, not everyone can, but some people can have access to this uh, quote-unquote service. And so you get to decide when you're going to pass away. It's the second family member that's been through this process and while it is heartbreaking, it's also, I find, beautiful in a way because you get to choose exactly how you're going to spend your last moments. It's very intentional. So because that has taken up time and emotional energy in the last few weeks, I have been focusing on minimum baseline when it comes to work. All the energy I had left was channeled towards coaching my clients and everything else had to go on the back burner. And let me tell you, I had to remind myself almost every day that that is okay. That our level of productivity cannot be the same from one week to another. It's just completely unrealistic. That's what we've been used to. That's what we've been expected to achieve in our system. But that is not in alignment with the uncertain nature of our lives. If we truly want to be present in the challenges that come our way, we've got to be able to adapt. Also, we've got to be able to adapt to the different rhythms of the seasons, the different rhythms of our menstrual cycle for example. So the last few weeks have been a good practice in letting go and focusing on what truly, truly matters. All this to say, I haven't recorded many solo episodes recently, and I do miss doing that. It's going to, I'm going to have the the capacity to start doing that again very soon. Today, we are doing something very different. I was invited on the podcast of my friend and former client, Rachel Meltzer. She's been a guest on the self Growth Nerds podcast a long time ago, and she has her own podcast called The Guidebook. It's for risk takers, nature lovers, adventurous souls, and that's pretty much how I would describe you as well. So I thought I'd introduce you to her podcast by sharing the episode where we have a conversation. We're so comfortable together that it just flowed and it was so much fun. We went deep, we laughed a lot, and I shared four frameworks for changing the way that you think, four frameworks that I taught Rachel uh, when, when I was working with her that had a, a big impact in her day-to-day that she still uses all the time. So I think you're going to have a good time listening to this and you're going to get a lot of value as well. Now, before I hand it over to Rachel, I want to remind you that I have availability for coaching. So if you've been curious to work together, you can book a free call where we're going to talk about where you're stuck, what you need help with, and I'll let you know what my approach can do for you and you'll be able to decide if you want to move forward. Okay, so. If you want to learn more, just go to selfgrownerds.com slash audacity and you'll be able to book a call right there. Okay, have a beautiful week and now let's dive into my conversation with Rachel. Okay. Yay! Okay, so um, do you want to introduce yourself, your name, what you do, what you like to do for adventures outside? 
Sure. My name is Marie from Self Girl Nerds. I am a coach. I am a book nerd. I love to go outside. I used to be a thru hiker, but now I would say I'm a lot more mellow. <laughs> I love to walk by the canal. I, I live in front of a canal. I, I love to take long walks by the canal or by the river or go on little hikes, but then end up like in a cozy cabin afterwards. <laughs> Hell yeah. I love that. I feel like you've given me a lot of permission to not be an extreme adventurer anymore. I think there's a lot of like pressure on social media, especially when you finish a through hike to like go and do all these big things. And I pushed myself so hard for years to like do these really intense climbing trips and ski trips and like feel like I need to go on another through hike. And in reality, like I just want to go for a walk in my neighborhood and the occasional hike and like camp in my car and not try hard, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you don't always want to be trying hard. Sometimes you just want to be able to enjoy nature without <laughs> any hassle. Yeah. Although I am feeling the pull this summer. This summer I want to go on canoe camping trips. Yeah, that would be cool. I like that. That is what I'm feeling called towards. So. Yeah. Hell yeah. I love the um, just following what you're feeling instead of, I don't know, the external pressure is not helpful sometimes. <laughs> Exactly. Last summer, I didn't. I didn't go camping once. I didn't want to be in a tent. That was the last thing that sounded appealing to me. But next summer, I know there's going to be a lot more camping. So you know, just depends yeah. what you feel like in the moment. Yeah, yeah. We go through phases. I used to be like fully obsessed with climbing, and lately, like I just paused my gym membership, my climbing gym membership, for the first time in like. I don't know, since 2019. And it feels so insane because it kind of became like a part of my identity, even though I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's not necessarily like uh, useful for it to be a part of my identity in some ways because it starts to limit you. Like, I have to go to the gym even when I don't want to. And now I'm like, I don't know, I feel good. I haven't thought about the gym. I haven't thought about climbing in like two weeks. <laughs> I feel great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's amazing that you give yourself this permission. It's freedom. It's so much different. We think of freedom as like these things that, or I do at least, I've seen on social media or um, being able to do all these big awesome things. But freedom can also just be going for a walk whenever you want and not doing things you don't want to do. <laughs> exactly. You know, this reminds me of like when we were teenagers trying out like, oh, I'm going to be goth. I'm going to be gothic <laughs> for six months. And then like the next day you wake up and completely change your mind. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like the experimentation of it all. It's been beautiful. Yeah. Find all these little pieces of yourself. Try things on. I'm trying to learn roller skating. And it's a very different vibe from anything I've ever done before. <laughs> I thought because I skied, I would like be good at skating, and that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to. What was that? You said you posted a video the other day that like, oh, I just loved it. I really resonated with it. It was like you're not entitled to like skip uh, being incompetent. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. You're not entitled to skipping the phases of incompetence. Yeah. When you start something new, like most people just are so uncomfortable at, at sucking at it and they want to be good at it right away. Otherwise, they make it mean it's not for them. But there's a lot of value in having the strength to be like, you know what? I'm not going to be good at this and that's fine. Yeah. That's just super normal. Yeah. I loved that. Just like that kids. Just like kids. Kids don't care. Like they, they fall down. They fall flat on their face. Like... They, they don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. And like anyone you see that is successful that you're like comparing yourself to or looking up to or like, I want to be like them. All of those people went through those phases of incompetence to get there. You don't get good by doing good all the time. Mm hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I love um, I, I always think about what's her name? Um, the, the founder of Spanx. <laughs> she's like a super businesswoman and she says that when she was growing up in her family her dad would always say like uh, would always ask around dinner time how did you fail today Ooh. and it was celebrated to fail 
if you don't fail, it means you don't try. So she grew up learning that you needed to try things and fail at them. And I think that's one of the reasons she became so successful. Wow. Sarah like Blakely. That. Sarah cool. Blakely. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. I've like listened to a podcast interview with her before, but I could not remember her name to save my life. <laughs> wow. Mm. I really like that. That's nice. That's a good journal prompt too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's go back to the beginning. You've had a few careers now and almost all of them are entrepreneurial. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear more about how you've evolved through each of those and like where your entrepreneurial spirit really comes from and what it thrives on. Yeah, that's a great, that's a big question. <laughs> well, my entrepreneurial spirit definitely, definitely comes from my parents because they always had a business. They met and then a year after they met, they they founded their business. So, you know, when I was born, they already were working together and building together. And that's what I saw growing up and that's what I found so inspiring. And my dad was always, was the vision, well, I say was, he still <laughs> is. Uh, my dad is the visionary. Like he always told me, you've got to design your own life. That's amazing. However you want to. Mm-hmm. So that's where it comes from. Um, I love that. And my different careers, I studied, I did two degrees, one in television, but I never worked in television. Wow, I didn't know that. And then one in, no, fun fact, weird fact. (laughs) (laughs) And then I went straight to graphic design. I studied graphic design, and then my last year studying graphic design, uh, my final project was the branding of a coffee truck that I started with my ex, one of my exes, when I lived in London in the UK. We wanted to open up like a coffee shop slash creative space. So we thought, let's just start with a coffee truck, and that's going to, you know, we're going to learn the ropes And so we would go to markets, we would go to festivals, like I went to Glastonbury, one of the biggest music festivals in Europe, and uh, we did that for for a while. And just when we were about to open up like a, a proper coffee shop, I decided to come back to Montreal, to Canada. I missed home too much. Wow. I was like, when you open a coffee shop, you're like putting roots down. Because mm-hmm. I, I, w- I used to love my customers. Used to love my customers. And I'm like, okay, if I open a coffee shop, this is not like a short-term project, mm-hmm. right? So I freaked out and I decided to come home, run wow. home. And so then I had kept doing some, some like graphic design uh, on a, as a freelancer. So I, I when I came home to Canada, I kept freelancing as a designer for a music school in London. So I would work off of my kitchen table as a freelancer. And then in the sideline, I was building my contacts in Montreal, local, like getting to know people locally. And then I transitioned to working with people here, uh, design studios, design agencies. And then eventually I was like, oh, I think I should try to be an employee at least once in my life. (laughs) Really? (laughs) And, uh, and, and that lasted eight months. I was hired somewhere. <laughs> and after eight months, I was like, that's it. I'm pulling the plug. I'm gone. You're and then do, do I keep going or do you have any questions for me? No, this is great. I think it's helpful to see, like, it's not a straight shot to where you are now. And I think that that's true no. for most people. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of inspiring to see the, like, darts back and forth to all these different things I mean I've had the same experience I've gone through like I went to school to be a teacher and a politician and I tried teaching I tried politics I tried law didn't like any of it had a mental breakdown became a barista (laughs) and now I'm a freelancer (laughs) so it like (laughs) we all go through these like winding paths but we have in this this image in our mind that it's a straight shot or someone you see who's further along than you like got there and knew how to get there and it's just not true it's almost never true of any human that they got somewhere as a straight shot and it's cool to see all these different ways that you get to where you are 
Mm-hmm. I love hearing people's stories of how they got to where they are. And I mean, whenever I meet someone who's too attached to the idea that it should be a straight shot, they're mm. limiting themselves yeah, in the sh- what they could try. Yeah, they're shooting themselves. That they're way, sh- you, you exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a right way. There's what she should do. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I studied engineering for six <laughs> years. I have to keep going in that in that direction, and I, I don't want to minimize that. I know it can be really hard mm-hmm. um, to free ourselves from cultural expectations and cultural pressures, um, but I think it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So totally. anyway, that's a. Big philosophical conversation. <laughs> back to uh, back to my journey. I eventually, uh, so I was a freelance designer and illustrator. Towards the end of that career, I was doing a lot more illustrating. I and actually then I decided to go. I found you because you were doing illustrations for the PCT and people who are yeah, hiking. yeah. I wanted to be the Brené Brown of hiking. That was I my love goal. that for you. What a great yeah. phase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started illustrating like the all the physical, uh, not the physical, the psychological and emotional preparation of doing a through hike. And yeah, that's how many people I think found me on Instagram. Um, and then I went actually to through hike the PCT. And then when I came back, my life was like changed. Uh, I I really wanted to, I had proven to myself that I could do the impossible. Yeah. So I was like, what, what, next? what now? I want more freedom. So being a freelancer is cool, but I was creating for other people. So I wanted to create for myself and I wanted, you know, more freedom in my schedule. I wanted more creative freedom. I wanted more human connection. So I started dabbling and trying different things. I created an online course for aspiring through hikers. And then eventually that led me to sign up for coach training and became a coach that way. And I, at the beginning, I was working with a lot of people that wanted to become through hikers, but then started helping them with their marriage, with their career transitions. And, you know, it, uh, everything it, it opened up on all aspects of life, all big transitions and big life decisions. Mm. I just love to work with nature lovers, with creatives, with weirdos and people that just want to, that just don't feel like they fit in and they want to create, create their own path, design their own life. Like I was talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. I love that description of of the people you like to work with. It's so it makes so much sense for you. And <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> Does it match? Does it match with you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And it's cool too, because like I guess I never realized that your parents were entrepreneurs that work together as well. And I had the same experience. Like my parents have shared a desk, shared an office on and off my entire life. They've had like five different businesses. And I couldn't even imagine I mean I could imagine being an employee but like it was very normal I couldn't imagine entrepreneurship not being an option and a lot of people Mm. grow up not thinking it is an option you know and thinking like Mm. that that's an alternative path or something and even like my parents parents frowned upon them when they first started their businesses because they were like oh you can't see success not that and you won't be able to support your kids and like all this stuff and they struggled sometimes for sure but like they are very successful now and they own the building that their car repair shop is in and they run a thriving business and they like own multiple buildings that they rent out to other businesses. And it's wild to see how much they've grown while I'm also growing my business and see like, even though they're your parents and they're older than you, when you're doing these things at the same time together, but separately sort of it, you just realize like, Oh, they're still growing. And I hope when I'm their age, I will also still be growing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. So true. There's no limit to your growth when you're an entrepreneur. It's like, it's the ultimate growth journey. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to grow yourself in order for your business to grow. Like, it directly affects mm-hmm. your business. Mm-hmm. 100%. 
what made you decide that you wanted to um, become a certified coach? And like, how did you decide when it was time to invest in your business like that, like to take a course and work with yeah, a coach? That, that's a great question. I was teaching this uh, through hiking course and I remember this man telling me about how he wanted to go on a long distance hike, but he was scared of leaving his wife behind of like what would happen if he did. And I didn't have the tools back then to help him through that. Yeah. That's I felt a bit stuck. I wanted to like, lead him to a perspective shift, but I didn't know how. So um, I was like, okay, I need, I need help. I need extra tools. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started talking to people who had trained as coaches and doing some research and very quickly decided to sign up. I, I found like a coaching school and it was starting in 10 days. The, 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 <laughs> the course was starting in 10 days. So I was like, okay, let's do it. Let's jump in. Wow. Wow. Also, like I was in love, I shouldn't say in love, but I was fascinated by the podcast Unfuck Your Brain yeah. by Carol Lowenthal. I was like, her job is freaking amazing, but I was not realizing, I, wait, I could actually do that job too. And then one day that's what happened. That's what always happens for me. I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, I can actually do it too. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. It sort of actually is the perfect segue into the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is that through my – I've been doing coaching with you. We've done it two years in a row now, first quarter, which is such a good way to start the year. And I love all of these tools that you've taught me during our coaching sessions, and I'd love to share some of them with the people who are listening to this podcast. Um, and that reminds me of – this idea of like removing I don't know from your vocabulary and removing the shoulds and asking better questions like you're really good at asking better questions <laughs> and one of those questions that has helped open possibility for me is like the how can I like instead of thinking like uh, I need to make $5,000 this month. I don't know if I can. And starting to spiral into all the worries and all the reasons why it might not work and all the things you have to pay for, thinking instead, how can I make $5,000 a month and opening it up to like, oh, I could change this about my business. I could optimize this about my outreach. I could like, you get all of these possibilities. And I actually listened to a podcast episode of Unfuck Your Brain like a really long time ago, I think in like 2020, when I was just like on a walk in North Carolina, I remember the trip. I was on like I can picture it in my mind because sometimes you know when you listen to a podcast and it was like so meaningful yes. for you that you can like put yourself back yes. in the moment you heard it <laughs> that is so powerful that happens to me all the time yes <laughs> And it was like this particular episode. And every time you remind me of the better questions you can ask and asking yourself, how can I? I think back to like that exact moment when I realized like, oh, actually, I could probably do some of these things. And it helps break away from like, say when you're scrolling on Instagram and you see someone who's doing what you want to do and you feel jealous or you feel envious or you feel like, oh, I can't possibly do that. How could I do that? And instead, you realize like that could be me one day. How the fuck do I get there? Let's go. You know what I mean? How do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like when Using you as... yeah, yeah, as a fuel. I say like, go find someone you're jealous of and and ask yourself, okay, what what's the permission they're giving themselves that I'm not giving myself, and how can I get more of what they have that seems to to light something up in me. Mm, mm. But yeah, so true. Asking yourself better questions, like the quality. There's a quote, I think, by Anais Nin about that. The quality of your questions is going to determine the quality of your life. Mm. So many people, I hear their questions. It's their yes or no questions. Is this going to work? Ah. And our, our, brain, our brains have a negativity bias. So if you ask the question, is this going to work, your brain's going to go look for all the ways it won't. Mm. And, oh, do I have enough money for this? Yes or no? The, the Your brain is going to go with no. Instead of thinking, okay, how can I, you know, if I really want to do this, how can I find the money? How can I maybe make more? Yeah. Like you said, how? Okay. Yeah. Instead of asking, is this going to work? How can I make it work? Yeah. I never is thought. Is it a good idea? 
No, sorry. Go ahead. Is it a good idea? Uh, is, is it a good idea to hire Rachel or is it a good idea to hire Marie? It's like, okay, how can I make sure I get the most out of this investment? Mm-hmm. How can I make sure I get the most of working with this person? It opens up your creativity. Yeah, yeah. It feels uh, expansive. It feels like you're there's more space to move around and you can sort of like explore without pressure rather than like is this going to work puts a lot of pressure on you and the results of whatever you're gonna do too Mm -hmm. yeah and it's like well maybe it won't work the first time but then it can work a little bit better the second time and then work even even better the third time and eventually you'll get there it's like yeah yeah yeah. Being a lot more playful. Being a lot more playful in our approach to life. I love that. I think um it reminds me of also like just listening to those voices that are in your head, like your inner child and and whoever else is sitting at the table. One time we were in coaching and <laughs> you pulled out your whiteboard and you like drew a big table on it and you were like, who's sitting here? Who's talking to you in your head right now? And we like individualized all these voices in my head that were, because I was having all these conflicting thoughts of like, I just want to like do arts and crafts and watch TV and be lazy, be lazy, quote unquote. And I also have this voice in my head that's like, I have to do work right now. We need to make money. We're not going to be able to pay rent and all these other noises. The work police. Yeah. (laughs) There's like the grown up and the teenager. (laughs) And then there's just someone in there that's just like rolling around on the floor screaming. (laughs) And that was so helpful (laughs) to like visualize that way because I had never thought about it like that. Like to me, it's just like, this is all my voice and it's all important to listen to. And in reality, it's just thoughts. Like when you can get that separation of like you and your thoughts, it just makes it easier to like detangle and deal with and find peace and calmness and like determine what to do in a rational and like nice way. (laughs) Exactly. It's uh, it's there. There are clusters of thoughts that form different parts of you, like sub personalities. And I remember that exact moment. You came into our session together, and it was like everyone around the meeting table is shouting, and you can't just you can't focus on anything. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine that. Like, uh, it ha- th- that was that chaos that was going on in your mind. And that's one of my favorite things to do with my clients because it's like we can only move forward if if all the parts of you, all the staff members in like the company that is your mind, <laughs> uh, if they work collaboratively and peacefully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, just like in the real world. Mm-hmm. It's like, a, well, actually, this is inspired by the uh, IFS, Internal Family Systems, which is a therapeutic model that was invented by Richard Schwartz. And that that's also inspired by systems thinking. So systems thinking in a family or in a workplace. If in a workplace, everyone's shouting at each other, they cannot go any, they can't make progress towards their vision. Mm. And it's the same thing with us and our own brains. That's why it's so important to figure out who's in there and what they need in order to, to feel heard and calm down and be collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. It was so nice to go through that with you. And I was like in a tornado of a brain space. And it's funny too, because like, obviously coaches need coaches. Like I know you've worked with coaches before, obviously you've done life coach school and I needed that from you that day. And it's so funny because like a week later, one of my clients came into one of our coaching sessions and was like a full energy tornado. And I I showed her that same thing that you showed me. And I asked her like to do it as a journal prompt later. And she messaged me on Slack later and was like, thank you so much. I didn't expect to be like that. I'm so sorry. And I was like, you don't need to apologize. And then she was like, these are all my voices. It's amazing. I can do things now. (laughs) And it's like, if you walked into like a real room and all those people were standing around the table screaming at you and you're supposed to be doing a project with them, would it get done? And absolutely not. Like, of course it makes sense that this is how we would deal with this. 
Yeah. You'd be like, whoa, okay, everybody sit down <laughs> and we're going to speak one at a time. Okay. One at a time. Okay. Robert, <laughs> you speak first. It's like the preschool teacher being like, quiet coyote, everybody. <laughs> 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 yes oh man yeah it also um i have two more that i want to go over with you that we went over in coaching that yeah. i loved but before we talk about that i just thought of something that i was thinking of during the first point that we were talking about about asking the right questions and and using envy and jealousy as fuel i have found <laughs> that using envy and jealousy as fuel is much, much harder with people in my own industry. For example, and I am not afraid to say this at all because it's just the truth. I have always been envious and jealous, jealous, envious and jealous <laughs> of, of Alex Catoni from the Coffee Posse because she's just like on fire. She's amazing. And of course she is. She has like an entire team of people. She has a degree in marketing and broadcasting and everything she is doing, she is extremely experienced and educated in. She's been making mistakes and growing for 10 years before she even started the business she's doing now, which I see as very successful. Like she's so many steps ahead of me. But it is so hard for me to use that as fuel and see like, what is she doing? What is she giving herself permission to do? Because it just, it, it feels too, I don't know, it hits too close to home. It feels too threatened. There's something about it where I'm just like, I just can't look at this as like, compare it, something that I can use to strive for. Like, I just can't do it. So I've switched to people in other industries and looking at what they're doing and how they're using tools individually. Like, for example, my latest obsession is Liz Wilcox, who you turned me on to with her email marketing and the way <laughs> she writes her copy. And like, at the end of the day, she is a marketer and she is a great writer. And I love email marketing and I do a lot of it for e-commerce, but I have struggled with email marketing for my own business and my own website copy and all these things. And it's been so helpful to be in her group and, and learning from her and seeing what she's doing and using that as a piece of the puzzle for success and looking at other people who are doing like coaching for other industries like you, for example, or looking at other people who are doing content writing or whatever, finding these people like I love following travel content creators and travel writers, because they are doing things that I want to be doing, and they are doing them well, but they're doing it in a different industry. So it doesn't feel so I don't know what it I don't know what it is or why that's easier, but I will say like if you're really struggling to fuel to use jealousy and envy as fuel and get out of that comparison trap, it can be really helpful to step away from your industry or people who are super similar to you or your direct competitors and look at people in other industries and niches to find some separation. It's kind of like how you separate your thoughts from yourself at the table like that and and you do it with with the the content you're consuming, the people you're looking up to. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. I've also tried like not following any coaches that were too similar to me mm -hmm. because then it always takes you back to I don't I don't know, it it keeps you away from how from focusing on what you want to create from like creative freedom. But it's hard to pinpoint what exactly is going on. Yeah. I think it's great advice, though, to to unfollow as much as possible the people that are doing the same thing. It's not helpful. Yeah, yeah. And anything that feels shitty to you. Like, I don't follow – I used to feel compelled to follow these people on Instagram because they were popular or because they were in my industry or because so-and-so is on – whatever podcast or whatever you know what I mean like there was just like a social pressure almost especially in the through hiking community there's like popular through hikers and every through hiker follows them and it's just like actually if I just don't want to follow them I'm just not going to and if this makes me feel bad I'm no. just not gonna follow it and that has been so much better mm -hmm. and I also go on social media so much less because there's not as much to scroll through so I just I get bored after like three minutes because I just don't have any following turned That's on. amazing. You have Marie kondo your social media. Truly. Just, keeps, just keep what <laughs> sparks joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. It's actually like that. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. 
I'll, I'll just add to, to, to end with like, it's just an act of self love. You're like telling yourself, mm -hmm. I don't deserve to feel crappy about myself. Let, let, let me just remove everything in my life as much as possible that makes me feel crappy. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You have to. If you want to like have creative energy, I feel like you need to do that, like <sighs> that, that clean out, you know? Yeah, we have like there's a limited amount of spoons of energy that we have. So if you have 10 spoons in a given day and you spend like five spoons worrying about other people and how they are better than you or further ahead than you, then you've wasted five spoons on something that is not useful. Yes. Yeah. Truth. The spoon theory. Ugh, everybody around here, when I moved to this town, for some reason, like everybody here knows spoon theory and talks about it. And it's so helpful. Where does it I, come from? I don't know. I'd never heard of it until I moved here. <laughs> I like it. I keep hearing about it. I don't remember where, where it came from. Mm. Yeah, I have no idea. I'll have to look that up after. Maybe I'll put it in the in the notes. <laughs> I'll put it in the, mm. the outro for everybody. <laughs> Um, but it does bring us to a, a really good point of like, we just talked about this the day before yesterday, how hard and um, multifaceted self-compassion can be. There are so many ways to be compassionate towards yourself. And there are so many things that being compassionate towards yourself can do for you, but it can be really challenging for some of us. And mm -hmm. I guess like we've both been on this journey. So, but I feel like there's so many entry points and so many ways you can like find your way, I guess. Like what is the, what is one of the starting points you most commonly find for self-compassion among the people you coach and and maybe even with yourself that's a, a good question i would say it goes back to what we were talking about the different characters around the table and as you're you're basically you're the ceo you're the person who can hear all these different parts of you and your relationship with them is going to be what has the most impact on the results you create in your life. So for example, if you've got this uh, part of you that you don't like, and you keep telling that part of you to shut up, <laughs> like for you, one of the parts that you struggle with, w w which one would you say you struggle with the most? I Is it always, the teenager or the work pool? The teenager. I always want to tell the teenager to shut up. And I'm always like, you're right, work police. I am lazy. <laughs> Okay, so the part of you that wants to create keychains and just chill. Yeah. Okay. So your relationship with them, that's what I encourage my clients to, to look at. Do you, as the CEO, tell that staff member, like, shut up, just get in line? How would that make someone feel? Like, if you were actually that person in a company and that's what your boss was to tell you, would that make you want to show up better for them? Not really. So it's not going it, to, it's counterintuitive because you're at the end of the day, what you want is to have a good time. You want to feel good in your day to day. And you think this is the way you think that like tr shouting at this, these different parts of you and trying to repress them is going to, to help you have be a better time in your life. But it actually does the opposite because it doesn't make you want to show up. That's why like you might struggle to wake up in the morning if like your inner workplace is like a, a shit show, <laughs> you know, and sometimes I, I compare it to a, a company. Sometimes I also talk about reparenting. Imagine like a kid being told by their parent, because that's probably what happened for many of us. Like when they were struggling, being told by like their busy, overwhelmed parent, come on, suck it up, just suck mm -hmm. it up. No time to cry. We got to go. We got to run out the door because I got to get to work to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've, many of us have been accustomed to growing up. That's what we've integrated. And now that's something we have to rewire. And it's just about noticing the way we talk to ourselves um, and slowly but surely reparenting ourselves and telling ourselves what we needed to hear back then. Yeah, yeah. Which is like... It which is, I'm not saying like go all the way and just be nice to you, like, like just cuddle yourself. No, it's like, okay, 
what's going on? Tell me what you need. It's like lo- loving, f- firm and loving self-talk. Yeah. 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 It's kind of challenging to notice it and to know what to do next, like to know how to talk to yourself when you've spent your whole life being like, get up, get out of bed, let's go. We're already late, having a hectic day. You don't deserve (laughs) to cry and stop and have feelings right now. Like all of those things that we've internalized. It's like, if that's what you're used to saying, then like, what what do you say instead? (laughs) You need like, yeah. Well, the the turning one one of the turning points for me is when I was um, I had my nephews, my former nephews, a nephew that I lost in my separation. So sad. I, I, I'm laughing, but it's actually quite sad. I have these <laughs> if you two laugh, nephews. You, if you don't laugh, you cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was with my former partner, I, I had these two nephews, and one of them was a baby he was crying in my arms and his little brother was two years old and he came towards us and he like put his little hand on the baby and he said, it's okay. I'm here. Marie's here. Mom is here. It's okay. And I was like, wow, he's two years old. He's doing that. And it's so soothing. And that is what I need to do more of with myself. I never thought about that. Like that that's, way. What, that's what we all deserved throughout her whole childhood that many of us didn't get. Right. And I think that we've we've got this like internal drought of like unconditional love. Lack of con- lack of unconditional love. And like what's the and just positive regard unconditional positive regard so yeah for me like I just copy pasted that sentence and sometimes I'm just sitting there telling myself it's okay it's okay Marie is here (laughs) (laughs) I like sit sit in my bath I have like moments I can think of of like thinking about um, me freaking out about something that maybe I posted on social media that might be like an unpopular opinion and I'm scared that I'm going to get like a negative feedback. So I'm just panicking, sitting there in my bath and telling myself, it's okay. Here are the people that will still love me if this goes wrong. And then I was like naming out loud (laughs) the people in my life that would still just be there and love me anyway if everything was, if like my reputation was going to go to pieces. That's really sweet. (laughs) It's so funny too. It's just like... That's one of those situations, like, you realize that you weren't necessarily, like, you needed some some compassion in that moment. But, like, if I were in that situation, I would just be like, it's fucking fine. You're going to be fine. Who cares? Who even cares anyway? Who cares? And you just get in this, like, aggressively, like, push it away mindset. But you realize, like, oh, actually, I just need some compassion right now. Mm -hmm. But I was not, it was not always the case. I had to do that, that work with, with coaches and with my therapist. Um, and it's, it's been a journey in the last three years ish. Yeah. Like that's, that was not my go-to before. So that's really something that you can change that you can practice and and change like one little step, one little cringy moment at a time. (laughs) So that's the thing. People tell me like, just cringe to talk to yourself that way. Yeah, it's cringe just because it's it's unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's. I think it's the best. Yeah, yeah, it just takes practice. Yeah. And the way, like the example that you gave of how you would react, it's all in the mind. Where what we want is we want to calm our nervous system down, and that is our body. So we, we don't want to just reassure ourselves with like positive thoughts. We, we want to, the, the, the knowing that it's going to be okay to seep into our pores, like to seep into us on a cellular level. That's why I always uh, like put my hand on my heart and try to really 
feel it in my body that it's okay that I am still loved even though even if I might be rejected professionally or get like negative feedback from someone I'm still safe I'm still I'm not dying but I need to know that in my cells and you've said that you have a meditation you used to help you with that that can also be useful to just learn it's like you learn a new language so just like you would if you're learning spanish you would listen maybe to spanish podcasts or spanish movies well if you're learning self compassion you've got to listen to self compassionate voices yeah it's if, true maybe it's... that's a coach maybe that's like a, a meditation app stuff like that yeah yeah i do talk about it with you and i talk about it with my therapist which is helpful Um, and then I also listen to on Insight Timer, the app, uh, I listen to Sarah Blondin. She has free mm. self-compassion guided meditations. And every single time I do one of those, I end up crying because she'll be like, put your hand over your heart. And then she'll like tell you what to say to yourself. And you have to like, you don't have to, but she says like, repeat after me out loud. And she tells you what to say to yourself. And that's Uh, really the only extent of learning what to say to myself that I have ever had and it freaking works man it is so helpful by the end of one of those meditations I've like cried all the tears I need to cry I'm calm I feel loved my body feels better mentally I feel better but like it is scary to sit down and do that and I do have to like be in a closed room with like headphones on and assume that no one can mm -hmm. hear me and like <laughs> It feels, it feels embarrassing. And I think that there is a sense of shame about it. There's like, I was actually listening to a podcast today about the difference between shame and guilt. Like shame is something that you hold like, I do, I did this. I, I am wrong. I am I bad. Am bad. I, yeah. And yeah, yeah. guilt is like, you did this bad. You did this wrong. And It's very much, I was like thinking about this because we just talked about self-compassion the other day while I was listening to this podcast on my walk this morning. And I was just thinking like, it is shame. Like this embarrassment about speaking kindly to myself and compassionately, compassionately to myself is shame. And I was actually like using bad self-talk out loud the other day when I was having a bad day. And my partner was like, I would never let somebody else talk to you like that do not talk to yourself that way. That's not okay. And I felt so, I was like, what do you mean? Like, it, it was like that embarrassment was like countering my embarrassment of, of like being nice to myself. Like you can't have both. And so I was just like, which one should I be embarrassed about? And my brain was all scrambling. And I was like, really just thinking about it for days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when like someone doesn't want to enable the way you shame yourself I remember that with in my uh, former relationship too there was a moment where I tend to shame myself when I'm not working hard enough when I'm not like I consider I'm not productive enough and mm. my partner didn't have that at all if he didn't do anything at work one day he would just rest in the evening and I was like how do you dare Where do you get think that? that you deserve to rest after not doing anything? And it made me so angry because I would have shamed myself in that in that moment and he did not. And I was like, what is that? You can't allow yourself such indulgence. But then <laughs> but it <laughs> oh. I feel you. I would have been you. I would have been you in that situation. Mm -hmm. But I've changed a lot since. I've realized like when we feel so strongly, it's because it touches a place in us that needs healing. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot of embarrassment because we've associated uh, rest to weakness and we've associated vulnerability to weakness. So like us being kind to ourselves is vulnerable. And so mm. we go self-kindness equals vulnerability equals weakness equals mm. shame. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, especially in this the society. Whole thing you need to 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 revolutionize. Can I say yeah. that? Rebel revolutionize, against. Revolutionize, yeah. Revolutionize, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to like reprogram yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Vulnerability and rest is strength. Yeah. Our strength. Yeah. 
Ugh. Yeah, it's just, you're just changing the code. That's my job. That's what I love to it's just changing the code for a much more sustainable way of being. Yeah, you're good at re- helping people reprogram. I love that. I also, there was one other one that I wanted to talk about that really helped yep. me because as you might know, and I don't want to say this in a negative way. I just believe it as the truth. Like I'm kind of a dramatic person, <laughs> um, but I guess <laughs> my partner likes to say I'm an enthusiastic person instead. Cause he's like, you don't need to be so negative about yourself. Don't be mean to yourself. And I'm like, but I, I, I am kind of dramatic. <laughs> um, I love your partner. I love your partner. Mm-hmm. Good, he's, good reframe. It's very helpful. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about a few times is like doing the math versus sitting in the drama. And the drama is, and I've done like I've I've literally written charts of like math drama and like let myself get those thoughts out on the drama side of like oh, I'm afraid. And this is, this goes along with asking the right questions, right? Like, oh, I'm afraid that like, I'm not going to get enough clients this month. And if I don't do it this way that I was taught how to do it, then I'm not going to get it, get enough clients. But like, in all reality, you could do it a different way and you probably will get clients. And like, you have all these worries about like, whatever it is you're struggling with. And then on the other side of things, it's like, okay, let's ask the right questions. How many clients do you actually need to get? How much money do you need to make? where will those clients come from? <laughs> what, how many assignments do you need to execute to do that? How are you going to put it on your schedule? Like all those little like realistic numbers things that really make it more like tangible and manageable. Like it is so much more tangible yeah. to think I just need three clients who want three blog posts a month each. And each one of those packages is going to be like $2,000. And so I'll make $6,000 a month if I get those clients. And this is how I'm going to get them by sending this many letters of introduction. I know they have a 25% success rate. So let's just do the math backwards. How many do I need to send in order to get that goal? How many follow-ups do I need to send? I already have a network. And that thinking is like (laughs) leading towards taking action towards the things that you want and need in a logical way that's like, yeah, I'm going to do it versus sitting there being like, I don't know if I can get clients. I don't know how to do it, even though you totally know how to do it and it's going to be fine. (laughs) No. Yeah. My clients always go, I don't know. I don't know. This is going on. I don't know. No, you know, you know, (laughs) you're just freaking out, but let's like put your two feet on the ground and, and see what's happening. Another example that comes to mind, I remember like uh, being in a session with a client and they were telling me, I'm never going to find a job. I keep applying and I never hear hear back. I was like, okay, tell me what are the facts here? Okay, well, I applied to three jobs and I got one interview. Okay, okay. Maybe you need to apply to more. If three jobs leads to one interview, then maybe you need to apply to six jobs. Then you get two interviews and you double your chances of getting a job. Or maybe you need to apply to nine jobs and then you might get three interviews and then you triple your chances of getting a job. But yeah, our brains just want to go in like the doom doom spiral. Doom spiraling. They find like comfort in doom spiraling. <laughs> you've But you've got to learn and that's what I do with my clients, learn to be like, no, actually, what are the numbers? Because when you put the numbers down on paper, you're like, oh, actually, there's not much to freak out about. I just need to keep <laughs> taking action. It's going to be fine, which is what happens with you. Like every, every time, time we've done that, you're like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> totally. <laughs> every time that exercise yeah. always works for me. And I love it so much, even when we're not like in session or whatever I'll just I do it for myself I do it for my clients as well and I have like a little template now like a little chart that I just like fill it in and I'm like okay we're back we're doing the thing we know how to do it (laughs) I do appreciate that like like our live sessions are so helpful and great and I love them every time and they do like uh they I feel like there are a lot of ups and downs emotionally and um Um, like your results go up and down a lot as well as an entrepreneur. And I mean, as a human. And so I feel like by myself, it's like these massive like tsunami like waves. (laughs) And but with the coaching with you, it's like a little wave crashing into the beach that like a toddler could jump in, you know, like it's fine. Everything's going to be fine. The waves Mm -hmm. don't get as big. 
Um, I but love then this also, analogy. it's these are the- <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I got. Oh, I got excited. No, you're good. You're also. good. <laughs> it is exciting. It also like you leave with the with like the, the bucket of beach tools where you can like build the sand castle or the rampart that like keeps the waves <laughs> like less intense. You know, <laughs> your little body board. You, you've got your like the bucket of beach tools and your little body board to ride the waves. <laughs> Yeah, wow. yeah. It's yeah, it's de- de-dramatizing the journey. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Yeah, you're very and good I, at that. Thank you. <laughs> and I have so much you know, I have so much fun working with you. Be like, I love the 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 challenge of you arrive and okay, how can we how can we <laughs> bring some peace? Yeah, yeah. You're very much the peacemaker the in my in my meeting room of the the CEO and the the teenager. <laughs> And I, I think about what we talked about. One one other thing we talked about, I think it was with you this week, how our anxiety just looks for things to feel anxious about. It's just oh, yeah, this like, energy, that, the lighthouse yeah. that just scans for things to worry about. Um, it, it's just this energy that uh, many of us have within us that we wake up with in the morning, like this anxious energy. And then it's like, okay, where am I going to channel this anxiety? And so instead of going for a walk, we're like, okay, I need to figure out a problem to fixate on. <laughs> I totally. experienced that recently. I've been experiencing that recently because I have, um, I have a new partner. You're the first person I say it to the first time no. I say it uh, in public. publicly. Uh, yes, <laughs> exclusive content on Rachel's oh, podcast. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> and this is pro- probably the best, most healthiest relationship I've ever been in. And my brain goes, no, we must find what's going wrong or what could go wrong. And it keeps scanning and scanning and scanning and there's literally nothing. Yeah. And yeah. Th- that feeling is crazy. And I can I see it same. now. I was telling Rachel, you have the same. We've talked about this before. Like you're also in a super healthy relationship. And yeah. if that's not something that you are used to, it's like this this uh, this feeling of scanning for problems and you have to tell yourself, no, it's okay. It's okay. Let's go do something. Let's bake a cake. Let's like make, let's do some arts and crafts, some keychains. Let's go for a walk because there's no problem to, to fix right now. Everything's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. And yeah, it's wild. This awareness is so important because many people are going to self-sabotage because they they don't have the self-awareness self-aware- of being like, okay, it's just my brain scanning for issues when there are none. Yeah, yeah. I also feel like I'm not on birth control and I'm not on any like uh, – I almost just said psychedelic. That is not the right word. I'm not on any like antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications anymore either. I'm like clean. I just take supplements now. Who am I? Who is she? She's doing great. But these (laughs) things do uh, make it so that your hormones are a little bit more uh, dramatic, especially if you haven't been eating well because I've been moving. So I haven't been eating the best lately. And I just noticed that like the day before my period – my, it's not me personally, but my hormones want to destroy my life. They're just like, there must be something wrong. I know this man doesn't actually yes. love me. <laughs> and it's yes. not true, of he's course. Just pretending. He must have been paid or something. Or he's, he wants something from me. I don't know what it is. Yeah, me too. The yeah. day before my period. like We should have been taught that. I don't know. Like I've learned that way too late. In life, that the day before your period, your hormones are just all the way up to the ceiling and they want to ruin you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish there was more literacy around like the female body for women. I didn't learn any of this until like three years ago and it has been a journey to figure Mm -hmm. things out with like my hormones and my health issues. I didn't even know I had PCOS until like three years ago and I've been dealing with having cysts since I was like 13 I just didn't know what it was was like are you kidding me no one told me and my gynecologist was like yeah you should have someone should have told you this by now and I was like (laughs) I just our healthcare system's a mess but regardless like being able to have that tool and being able to educate yourself and know what to look for to educate yourself is like 
just like with yeah. all the other things we talk about. Just having the right tools to be able to navigate what you're going through is, is really what matters at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Hell yeah. Instead of going in circles and getting frustrated that you're not, that you're struggling, that you should be able to do it on your own. It's like, no, maybe actually you need a hand. Yeah. yeah. I think it, like give yourself permission right now. I'm giving you permission <laughs> to not do everything on your own. And if you think that I've done everything on my own, I can tell you right now for free that I have not. You're literally speaking to my coach right now. <laughs> I go to therapy. <laughs> I go to a coach. <laughs> I've used multiple coaches to get to this point. I've taken courses like uh, ask for help and get the help that you need and like seek it out. And if you don't know what help you need, like talk to other people who are doing what you want to be doing and ask like, how did you get here? What help did you receive or seek out? to get to this point. Yes. Such good advice. To me, that's the best investment. I've in invested so much in teachers and therapy and co coaching. It, it's the best. Yeah. Because then it's with you for the rest of your life. So worth it. You'll make so, And that's something balance. I think we, yeah, that's something we need to normalize. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I completely agree. We are, we do not need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. <laughs> We need yeah. to pull ourselves up with our, our friends and mentors' hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it was really great having you on the show today, Marie. I'm so glad we got to talk twice in one week. It feels very special. Um, what a fun conversation this was. <laughs> this was very fruitful. I think people are really going to get a lot out of it. Uh, but, but also, you have, other, you have your own podcast and you have other content. Do you want to tell people where they can find you online? Yeah, my podcast is called Self Growth Nerds, and my Instagram too, Self Growth Nerds. So that's pretty much it. Look for Self Growth Nerds, and uh, you can listen to my podcast, or you can also book a discovery call with me on my website if uh, if you if all of this has piqued your interest, and I'll be happy to meet you. Heck yeah. If you love what you're hearing on the Self Growth Nerds podcast and you want individual help finding a new direction for your life and developing the courage to make your dreams a reality, you have to check out how we can work together on selfgrowthnerds.com or message me on Instagram at selfgrowthnerds. My clients say they would have needed that support years ago. So if you're tired of feeling like you're wasting your life, don't wait. Get in touch now. And I cannot wait to meet you.